Welcome to the Tomorrow Today podcast, Mapping the Future of Business. My name is Bhutle Lamini, your host and guide as we explore some of the changes that are taking place in the future of business, as well as some of the emerging trends, innovations impacting the future of work. In this episode, we are going to be diving into the most significant transformations that have taken place in the business world. That is hybrid work. As companies around the world continue to adapt, we are seeing lessons that are emerging that are definitely redefining the future of work. I wonder how it's been for you uh, as we have gone through uh, the last few years of uh, massive changes in the way that we do work. In this episode, we're going to be looking at beyond hybrid, what hybrid work is teaching us about the future of work. We have an excellent guest interview uh, with Andy Bounds, conducted by my colleague, Graham Codrington, look at some of the insights and the keys for success in hybrid work, as well as the takeaways that could shape the workplace of tomorrow. So let's jump in. The shift to hybrid more than just flexibility. When COVID-19 hit and uh, the pandemic changed the way that we work and the way that we do things, most companies had to rethink traditional office structures and the way that work is organized. So what started as a temporary solution quickly evolved into what we now know as the hybrid workplace. But it's more than just letting a few employees work from home every now and then, or maybe even a few days a week. It is more than just about flexibility as well. What hybrid work is teaching us is that flexibility on by itself isn't enough. It's about redefining how we work altogether. Take Microsoft, for example. Uh, their transition to hybrid work has led to some of the significant changes in the way that they work as a company. Not only how employees work, but how the company itself communicates. <laughs> This is very interesting because what they found was that 73% of their employees wanted continued remote work flexibility. And this is something that we found across many other companies as well. I know right now, as you're listening to this podcast, you probably have heard of many other companies that are mandating people to go back to work. And some of them actually forcing people and even saying that if you don't come to the office, then you no longer work here. This is not an advisable route to take because what we've seen is that employees and workers have actually realized that the way that we used to do work wasn't just cutting it. So this is what we found then at Microsoft that to make it more successful, Microsoft had to invest in tools, shifting away from constant real-time meetings and tools and systems that will enable asynchronous work and a culture of trust. That's a big key in all of this. As we think about hybrid work, it means that communication patterns where employees can collaborate um, regardless of their location or their time zone. This is a big shift. Now, I know you probably have heard so much about hybrid work. You've been living it for the last four years. And um, frankly, you might be thinking, is there anything new that we can think about or that we can talk about in this space? The truth of the matter is hybrid work is still changing and shaping the way that we work. And so let's think about some of the learnings or some of the successes that hybrid have actually brought about. So what are some of those key lessons that we actually learning from hybrid work right now? Well, if you take a look at a company like Salesforce, what they did is they embraced hybrid work early on. They called it the success from anywhere model. I mean, that is quite um, a way to think about it. It's about shifting the mindset from thinking that we can only succeed if we're in certain spaces or in a certain place. The company realized that productivity didn't just depend on being in the office. It was about empowering employees to have the right tools 
And as these platforms allowed their teams to stay connected, what was interesting is that their focus wasn't just on tools, but it was also on well-being. And so if you think about hybrid work, one of the things that it has changed dramatically is not just about thinking about the tools, thinking about the space. It's about thinking about the person behind the work. How do they feel about their work? How do they feel about the way that they do their work? And so what we saw at Salesforce is that they gave employees stipends to set up home offices and encouraged um, people to take time off and to avoid burnout. Now, I know that with the pandemic and with all that was going on, there was a huge focus on really thinking about people's well well-being. The biggest challenge that we can or the biggest mistake, rather, that we can make as we think about the future of work is to forget about the importance of well-being. That's what Dropbox actually did also very interestingly. Instead of going fully remote or fully hybrid, Dropbox declared a virtual first um, policy, or they called themselves the virtual first company. So what does that mean? For Dropbox, it actually meant that blending the office and home, but redefining the office entirely. <laughs> and so physical spaces that are now thought of as collaboration hubs, where employees can come together for team building and brainstorming, day-to-day -day work was now expected to happen remotely. So what we're seeing here from Dropbox is that they realize that in-person work should be intentional not routine. I, I, I think that bears repeating <laughs> that when you think about it, in-person work should be intentional, not routine. In other words, we should be intentional about why we need to be in the same space. Why do we need to come to the office? Why do we need to have this meeting where everybody is in the same place together? So what these companies are actually showing us is that hybrid work isn't just a blend of home and office. It is a mindset shift. It's about giving people and giving employees control over where, when, and how they work, but with structured guidelines to maintain productivity and engagement. And so these are some of the things that we are learning, but you can't ignore that you need technology as an enabler as well. We can't just talk about the future of work without discussing the role of technology. In the hybrid era, the physical office has become a tool. As a matter of fact, it has always been a tool. It's just that the way we thought about it was kind of messed up <laughs> because we thought about an office as work itself instead of thinking it about it as a tool that facilitates work to take place. Now, I know this talk of hybrid work doesn't apply in every setting, um, especially when you think about manufacturing, when you think about healthcare, places where people actually need to be there, they need to be holding, they need to be building, and they need to be doing things with their physical hands in a physical space. But the reality is that a huge percentage of the workforce today is not working in that kind of environment. And so that's where hybrid work becomes even more important. So when you think about what Cisco did uh, with their WebEx and you think about Zoom and how that's changed and even Microsoft Teams, there's still ongoing and you know development in these spaces when it comes to the technology. The, the key here is that technology has to facilitate connection not just communication. And so we've seen how these tools are already changing. They're changing to help us to uh, engage with one another. So there's more engagement in the tools. And uh, with the arrival of artificial intelligence, or as we call it at Tomorrow Today, intelligence assistance, we have seen that AI-driven scheduling, virtual whiteboards and platforms, that integrate everything from instant messaging to project management are now just part and parcel of how we work today. So 
technology is good and te technology is helping us to create a more successful hybrid space. Let me just speak about Zoom <laughs> as the company now. <laughs> I have always loved uh, this uh, this meme that was going around where people post this picture of Zoom, of the Zoom offices, and they say, why does Zoom have offices? <laughs> and uh, which is kind of funny, but the truth is every company does need that office space where people can come together and they do their work. And of course, where are the servers going to be kept? <laughs> but Zoom itself as a company is evolving in this space. I mean, they're focusing on features like virtual co-working spaces and real-time collaboration tools, which then stimulate uh, the dynamics of working side by side, even when we're not side by side. This shift tells us that in the future, or right now, <laughs> businesses need to invest in smarter tech that can support not just hybrid work, but whatever comes next, whether that's fully virtual, AI augmented workflows, or something we haven't even yet imagined. The reality is that with all the changes that are taking place in our world, we need to be ready for this changing world. So with all of these changes, one of the biggest challenges uh, is how we improve communication. When all of us are working in a hybrid environment, how do we make sure that our communication is still effective? It still allows us to be productive and to be fully impactful when we're communicating through the screen or through other virtual methods. To help us understand how we can overcome barriers to remote communication in a hybrid work, we have a special guest for this episode. My colleague, Graham Codrington, spoke to Andy Bounds. Andy is an author, an entrepreneur, and a sought after speaker who helps companies to sell more, communicate better, and lead with more impact. And so in this interview, we will look at Andy's big idea, which is how to overcome barriers to remote communication in a hybrid workspace, when the rules of the games have changed. So let's take a listen. So, Andy, thank you for your time. If we're thinking about being a future smart, future ready business, super clever by 2030, what's your big idea for us? Um, you have to be brilliant virtually. In other words, the days of face to face being the main communication mechanism are completely gone never coming back and we have to be at least as good virtually as we are in person it's no longer a nice to have it is business critical Ooh, i like that a bit controversial we'll get into that in a bit of detail but uh tell us a, a little bit about yourself why why are you interested in communication and connection and what do you do so i help my uh clients to communicate with more impact and make more sales so I'm a communication guy uh, and I have done this for many, many years. The things people find most interesting about me is usually my family background. My mum is blind. So when I was learning how to speak, the person who told me to speak can't see. So I became really good at describing stuff. So if you like, I have been spending 55, I am so old, 55 years communicating with someone who uh, doesn't see me. And the way the business world is now, we have got to build intimacy when we're not in an intimate setting anymore. We've got to build closeness when we're not close anymore. And so that ability to communicate in ways that with people who don't see the world the way we do, they may not see us at all, has become something we need to master. Now, I'm, what I'm hearing from you is this isn't a COVID conversation, right? This is not something that you're saying we need to do just because we had COVID or maybe you nervous of another lockdown in the future. I mean, I'm hearing you saying this is a strategic thing we need to think through. Oh, absolutely. Yes. I mean, uh, I, COVID was a joy and a gift that kept on giving for all of us, but that's gone now, <laughs> um, hopefully forever. Um, but this is, so most of the meetings I have now, most of them are virtual. I mean, the important ones are in person, but most of them um, are virtual. I'm going to say, 80% of my communications are virtual in some way. 
uh, and the face-to-face -face ones only happen because I had a good virtual one before that, yeah? And so, and then the follow-up is almost always virtual. That's not in person. So the vast majority of what we do is not in person anymore. Now, COVID accelerated this, but it was beginning to happen anyway. Um, and one thing that I always found was, if, say, I live in Liverpool, that's the north of England, if I had a customer in London, that's about four hours travel for me away from my house, if they want to meet with me, it's got to be really important to both of us for one of us to do four hours there and four hours back, an extra eight hours of dead time, my word, it's got to be important. And so the ability to not just be brilliant when you're virtual, but be brilliant when you're in person. So there's no drop off in intimacy. There's no drop off in quality. It's nothing to do with COVID. It's just the way the world is going. So I, I assume that like me, you've seen good and bad versions of this type of intimacy <laughs> yep. and communication. What are the biggest mistakes people are making? Well, there are a few, as you say. One of the first ones is, in the old days, if you had a bit about you, um, the vibe that comes around you, the aura would often be enough. If you're in Starbucks, it's just a bit of a positive buzz and interaction happens quite easily. Whereas when people are remote, interaction is not as obvious. And so one of the most important things to prepare nowadays are the questions you're going to ask to get the other person speaking. So, you know, when we've done presentations in the past and we've said, has everyone got any questions? And people say no. And it doesn't matter because you carry on. But it does matter if you've got a Teams meeting of 12 people and say any questions and no one says anything. So it's not enough to do lazy questioning. Any questions? Does that make sense? We now need to say, of these three things I've said, which of these is the most important? Why do you think that is? Might it have any problems? Uh, Graham, I've not heard from you for a minute. Can I just ask your feelings on this? And so being more assertive and being more deliberate with the questions we ask, that is essential. Other things we have to do is, I mean, you should always have a good first impression. We all know that. But first impressions are really important when you've not got the in-person niceness there. So again, if you want to prepare anything, prepare your opening. Like prepare your opening opening sentence. If you're going to start off by saying, you know, thank you so much for seeing me. And it's such a relief that you'll give me some of your time. Well, leaders don't want you to be grateful. They want you to be valuable. So you're much better off saying, I've been looking forward to our meeting. I found three new things I think will help you. They go, what are they? And your conversation has started. So there are two things, Graham. Number one, prepare better questions. And number two, prepare a better start. Andy, this is exactly the reason why uh, you were on my hit list of people to speak to. Because, I mean, I've, I've known you for many years. We've been privileged to share the stage once or twice, which I've always enjoyed. Um, and... You're so practical in the way that you just help people cut through all of that clutter and, and just make sense of that connection, that, that communication. And obviously, there are leadership implications and sales implications in particular to, to what you're saying. But is, is this really a key to unlocking like a future focused business in 2030. I, I'm, I'm trying to give you a really good question, but it might only be a softball and you can improve it. But I, I mean, it, it, it feels to me almost as if, it, is this really strategic? Is this really at the heart and soul uh, of, of business success? I think it might be uh, as a professional communicator, but what, what would you say to a leader who kind of thinks, ah, Yes, yes, sure. I need to get slightly better at doing Zoom meetings. I hear you, Andy. But is it more than that? Oh, it's a lot more than that. Um, the perception that others have of you. So your reputation in the marketplace, your reputation as a leader, your reputation as a company, um, people's view on how good you are stems from two things and only two things. Number one, how good you are. And number two, how well you communicate it. Yeah. So if you're a leader and you do this wonderful, brilliant, strategic piece of work and it is amazing, you've had the world's best thought leaders help you create it, and then you go and tell your team and you do it in a terrible way, then the only thing your team has seen is not your hard, diligent work. It's just the terrible presentation you've done this morning. So uh, you mentioned before about COVID, one delight we had in the UK was having what at the time was fairly inept communications from our government. 
And so there may be wonderful scientists in the laboratory, but all we heard was people like Boris Johnson stumbling over the slides. So we just thought, this is just absolute chaos. And it may have been, it may not have been, but all we had to judge was the communication we saw. So when people say, is it strategically important? I can't think of anything more important than saying stuff that works. Yeah, I, the, the one thing stuck in my mind of sort of looking at a distance at, at British government COVID briefings was, next slide, please. I mean, it's like literally on live international streaming TV, next slide, please. I mean, honestly, you could do better than that. But he, here's something that I've seen, Andy. So again, like people might say, yeah, that makes sense. We need to communicate better. Two problems that, that, that immediately jumped to my mind. The first one is the CEO's speech or the leader's speech has been written by some marketing agency. It, it's been then been word checked by legal and compliance. Um, somehow it's, it's been translated into Russian and back again in ChatGPT. I mean, it, it sounds... I mean, they literally might have got a voiceover artist to read it to do a better job because then the CEO, that was clearly not in his or her own voice, clearly not delivering it from the heart. And then you add on to that technology ineptness. Let me just be polite and put it that way. A Zoom background or a Teams background where if you lean back 10 centimeters, you blur into your background. And uh, apologies for this one, Andy, but your hair disappears. Uh, that's not your problem. <laughs> There's no background. You, you don't have that background. That. <laughs> yeah, but, but I mean, surely there's quite a lot to it. Uh, um, well, let me, I, I don't have a question to ask, but just to say, I mean, what, what, what do you think needs to be done to overcome some of the things I think you and I see fairly regularly from people who should know better, I would think. So there's there's a number of things. I mean, obviously, short term, but I do some training. So, you know, like getting people like me or you or like read some books or no, do no, something. Let, like let, get let's, let's be clear. Uh, let me clear, Andy. I'm very happy to send people your way. I don't do coaching. I don't like people that much. So any, okay. everybody who wants communication coaching, andybounds.com, uh, sorted. Okay. okay, but back, back to you. Right. Well, thank you, Greg. So, uh, so yes, and if that doesn't work or that doesn't sound very good, here's a very simple thing to ask yourself. You will have policies for all sorts of things in your company. You'll have strategies for all sorts of things. You'll have wonderful Oh, I don't know. You'll have got some agency in and consultancy and you'll probably have a four pillar thing, which is going to do something. I don't know. But ask yourself, do you have one of these for communication? Do you have a thing how we will improve and embed communication brilliance within our company? Have you got together with other senior leaders to say, are we world class at this? Do you have a constant, I mean, you have weekly updates to ask how everything's going with project 12 but you have monthly updates to say, are our communications good? It just doesn't get the weight it should. And I refer back to my previous thing. People will judge how good you are by number one, how good you are, but number two, how well you communicate it. So it is strategically essential that you invest time in this. And people will sometimes say, like you said, Graham, do we really have time? And I say, no, time is not about time. Time is about your outlook calendar. Like, you and I, Graham, don't really have time for this chat, but yet here we are because we put it in the Outlook calendar. And when yeah. people say, it's not my fault, I didn't have time, it's like time's fault. You go, no, it is strategically essential. Get time in your calendar, get the senior people in the room, don't allow people to deprioritize it if you want the outside world and other stakeholders to think you're as good as you are. Uh, I think that's that's spot on advice. And, uh, you know, I think some people might look at, at, at you and me and, and others who speak for a living and say, well, it's OK for you guys. I mean, you, you're just naturally good at it. You, you know, uh, my CEO is a smart person and not naturally good at speaking. Um, I don't know what what you've done to improve your skills. But, for example, myself, um, I I mean. I think of myself as a funny guy, but kind of in the dad jokes department, um, not really a humorist or a stand-up person, but humor is such an important part of any 
uh, communication uh, that wants to grab attention and, and get a message home. So I'm, I'm not looking to be the funniest guy you've ever heard or throw a joke in every line, but I do know that every piece of communication, there's an opportunity for a little bit of humor, even if it's just a little bit of a pun or a little one-liner, and that can be learnt. And literally, I've spent money in the past to uh, get stand-up comedians and actually, to be honest, hot tip here, get to the comedy writers. Each guy on stage who's, who's doing a good job has probably got a team of writers in the background. And I literally pay some money each year to spend a day with one of those types of people. And I present my presentation to them and I say, right, help me find the funny. Um, and uh, we literally work out, and if I only get one good line or one uh, joke out of it, I've done it 20 years in a row, so I've got at least 20 good jokes now, um, but then they work. And so just an example, I'm not saying everybody has to do that uh, level of work, but I love your idea of making it a, 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 a policy, a principle of the business, therefore something you measure, possibly even reward, um, and therefore put some effort in and put some time in your diary to improve it. I don't know if you've done anything uh, uh, that you can give us a hot tip to improve your speaking skills. Yeah, sure. Um, so two things there. Firstly, you said about some people will say, it's all right for you, it's your job. Um, and it's not far from when people say, oh, communicators, are they born or are they made? It's just such a, it's the nature nurture question, but it's just such a daft question. I'm fairly sure in the history of human biology, there's never been a new baby appears and someone says, oh, look, you've had a little communicator. You know what I mean? They're not born, they're made. The reason that people are okay at this is because they invest time in it because they think it's important. Um, you said before about humour. I mean, this is another tip which I find very useful. I love what you've said about humour there. Um, anyone listening to this, get yourself two piece, uh, get a piece of paper, two columns, left-hand column, just write down, what do people like when they're being communicated with. So yeah, humor, you say, Graham, they want things to be yeah. relevant. They want things to be interactive. They like anecdotes. They like um, stories. They like to learn things. They like it to be short, all that stuff, right? So left-hand column, you just list things that people like. And on the right-hand column, you just say, what do I need to do myself to become better at those things I've said on the left? So if people like humor, I need to do the thing that Graham just said about humor. People like interactivity, so I need to ask some questions. People like a bit of animation, so I probably need to move my backside forward on my chair a bit so I've got a bit more body language, natural energy, rather than leaning back. Uh, people like to learn things, so I need to teach them things. And this two-column table, Graham, it will take you about the duration of one cup of tea to do. Get yourself a cup of tea, and by the time you finish your cup of tea, you'll have got left-hand side, these are 10 things people love, right-hand side, these are 10 things I should do. Now, do you have to do all 10? No, but you have to do more than none of them. Just do more than none. <laughs> uh, this is this is top tip, uh, uh, top tips, yeah, top tips from from Andy. Uh, Andy, uh, before we finish our time here, uh, we've kind of talked about the future focused business. I think we've made a great point that intimate virtual communication is a is a key thing, and and the leaders listening, I'm sure, have been taking notes. I know another thing that, that you do with this uh, is you spend quite a lot of time with salespeople. I think the link is obvious, but just uh, give us a, a view of why this would be so important from a sales position, because I, I guess the same thing is happening in, in sales uh, as it is in general business communication, a lot more online, a lot more virtual, and that's changed the game a little bit, I suspect. Yeah, you're you, exactly right. So um, in the old days, um, a lot of people were trained very extensively in face-to-face -face selling. They weren't extensively trained in virtual selling. So now you've got a problem. Number one, getting someone to give you any time anyway. That's hard to even convince them to even have a Teams meeting with you. And then when you've done that, you've then got to be persuasive enough that they'll have another meeting with you, whether it's Teams or face-to-face -face again. And so it's exactly the same. So working out reasons why people should want to see you and spoiler alert, the fact you were founded in 1922 is not enough. You know, there has to be something of value to them. So what we're finding with salespeople now, they're saying, how do I get in front of people, virtually or face-to-face? -face? How do I convince them to buy from me? What do I say so they think I'm really glad I met you? Because if I just talk about my stuff, 
it doesn't work anymore because people can find out about your and everybody else's stuff online. So what should I talk about to actually get people taking the next step? But it's the same thing. It's all to do with intimacy. It's all to do with value. And again, if anybody wants a simple word to latch onto, the word teach. If you always teach somebody something, whether you're selling or whether you're communicating, such that they can look at you and say, well, I never knew that. Well, clearly you brought them some value and they might want to see you again. And the interesting thing is some people, when they hear what I've just said there, Gray, might be th looking at the uh, speakers or whatever they're listening to this on going, ha, ah, well, I never knew that. And that's the power of it. Um, <laughs> over uh, Christmas last year, I had a hip replacement and I was told I'd be off for one or two months. So I said to my customers, I love you all, but please leave me alone for two months because I might not be around. Well, for some reason, I got better after one month. So I came back beginning of January to an empty diary. There was nothing in my calendar for the whole month. And so this idea of teaching, what I did is I emailed all my contacts and I put the word new in there because that suggests teaching. So I said, hey, hey, you've had a good Christmas, happy new year, blah, blah, blah. While I've been out of action, I've done a bit of research and I found there are three new things that are going on in the sales world. If you've got 10 minutes, let me know and we can have a quick chat. And I send this out to people who admittedly who like me anyway. I managed to find some. But this word new, it's like, oh, I'll give Andy 10 minutes for a new stuff because they could teach them things. If I'd said, let's have a catch up, well, they might like me, they might not, but the word catch up, it's not important enough given how busy they are. So lead with words like new and teaching and valuable and insights and all that. We know all this stuff, but we can often forget it in our busy lives. Andy, I know that people will get some huge value out of, first of all, checking out your website, andybounds.com. We will put a link into the show notes in case you can't spell that out. There's some great resources, the type of stuff Andy's given us in the last 20 minutes. You'll, you'll find lots of that on his website. Uh, if I can advise people every Tuesday, uh, you must have been doing it for at least 10 years because I'm sure that's how long I've been subscribed. Uh, but there's a Tuesday tip every, uh, every Tuesday, which is worth its weight in gold. I think almost every other one gets shared between our team. We'll get it directly anyway but we just remind ourselves to read it um it anything else uh, that uh, people need to know in order to contact you or get hold of you and get more from you no the, i mean the easiest thing is either the uh, the website or uh, linkedin obviously uh, i'm on that and if anyone listening to this wants my tips you don't even have to be polite just contact me through linkedin and say the word tips you don't even have to say please we can work it out we can get them to you and as you say Graham, they're just little Email. I started doing them in June 2010, so it's like 14 years now. Okay. Um, so, yeah, so people are very welcome. It's just a little thing goes in your inbox every Tuesday. So if you want a little free tip just coming up every Tuesday, one of my customers said to me the other day, not everyone that comes is highly relevant to me, of course, because you're sending it to lots of people, but I like your name appearing in my inbox because it makes me think, oh, yeah, I'm supposed to be communicating well, aren't I? And that is probably what you are known for. Andy, I really thank you for your time. This has been uh, one of my favorite uh, ones. Don't tell anybody else I've interviewed, but, uh, you know. <laughs> no, but for, for me, seriously, this issue of communication, and I just love the way that you phrased it, you know, be good at what you do, but then how good are you at communicating that to others? If you're not good at that, you're not going to be here in 2030. So really appreciate it, Andy. Thanks so much for your time. No, you're welcome. Thank you. There you have it. Some excellent ideas from Andy's big idea, how to overcome barriers to remote communication in hybrid work when the rules of the game have changed. I really loved the idea of uh, building intimacy when you are communicating uh, in a virtual setting. I mean, have you thought about that? Have you thought about uh, taking time to consider how to make a better connection <laughs> uh, with the person on the other side without being the benefit of being in the shared space uh, or place? That could be quite hard, but I think that the more we apply ourselves, the more we think about uh, finding ways to connect better, uh, actually this will become uh, easier and, uh, and just part of how we do things. The other takeaway for me was the importance of preparation. Think about it. How, um, how often do you take the time uh, to consider all the elements that are necessary to making an impactful 
uh, communication and impactful engagement when you're connecting virtually? How often do you prepare before jumping into a virtual call? Uh, thinking about what elements are going to be important uh, for this uh, for this call. Uh, what's the best um, opening? <laughs> you know, in the same way when you prepare for a presentation, you also need to do the same when you are connecting virtually. And what are some of the better questions that I can prepare um, before I even go into an engagement. The other one was about humor. And I know that humor is one of those things where you, you kind of have to feed off each other for humor to work. Uh, uh, have you, you? I'm sure you've had that situation where you try to, uh, to tell a joke and it just falls flat. Um, how do you know that it, fall, it falls flat? You know because of the cues. You know, because the people look at you strange or they look at you like they don't know what you are going on about. <laughs> now, when you're in a virtual setting, some of those uh, things that that just being in the physical space um, help you to read the cues are not there. So how can you use it then uh, in that setting? Uh, we often think about being funny as something that only talented people or people that are born with it actually have a gift for. But what I've learned over and over is that it actually takes a lot of hard work to be funny and to use humor and to connect with people. It does take preparation. Uh, it means that uh, as you think about the different points that you're going to make is thinking about how can I make this relevant uh, or relatable or uh, connect with someone uh, in a way that goes just beyond from just transferring information. While there's an element of talent, um, you know, that is required to bring humor to your communication, a lot more of it is about preparation and creativity. So as we connect in a virtual environment, we need to be thinking about, okay, how are we making our meetings more engaging and more creative and more funny? Um, because, yeah, I mean, can you imagine those Zoom calls that we have to be on these days without a little bit of humor? And remember, the people you work with, whether they're colleagues or clients, they always are judging your effectiveness based on how well you communicate. So we can never underestimate the importance of communication. So it's better for us to, you know, to take the time to become better at communicating and uh, even in their virtual environment, especially because the success of the future highly depends on it. One of the biggest concerns around hybrid work is maintaining a company culture. How do you create a sense of belonging when people aren't in the same physical space? And, uh, and so companies have been really wrestling with this as, um, as, 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 uh, as this has been uh, changing. So, when you think about companies like Spotify, um, they have a unique approach here, especially because they look at their model as the work from anywhere model. But while it, that gives employees incredible flexibility, it also puts a responsibility on leaders to ensure that everyone still feels connected. And I think that whether people are working three days a week at the office and two anywhere else or vice versa. It doesn't matter. The point is, it's still the leader's responsibility to maintain that connection. And so what Spotify does is hosting these virtual social events and they are committed to also the in-person team sessions or team retreats a few times a year. We need to be thinking more and more like this as leaders. How do we keep those connections, um, those human-to-human -human connections, uh, uh, you know, alive in our in our organizations and in our in our workforce? Hybrid work is teaching us that culture isn't just bound by location. It's about shared values. It's about shared trust, and it's about shared and it's about transparency. So leaders, we need to over-communicate, use digital tools effectively, and create intentional moments for connection. So I'm hoping that you're already getting the picture here. There's a lot that uh, the hybrid work has changed uh, in the way that we do things. 
So what does this mean for you then and the future of work? It's very clear that hybrid work isn't a stopgap, that hybrid work is a permanent fixture in the way that we do things. Whether you're forcing everybody to go back to the office or not, the truth of the matter is the way that we communicate, the way that we meet is no longer going to be the same anymore. Whether people are forced to be sitting in the office, they are still going to be meeting virtually, they're still going to be communicating virtually. And so the future of work is not about where we work, but how we work. And so the question for you then, as we think about all of these changes in the workplace is, which of these ideas from this episode are you going to go out and implement immediately for success in the future of work uh, in the hybrid workplace? I hope that uh, from everything that we've been able to share in this episode, there's just something that you can go out immediately and start using in terms of making sure that you are well positioned for success in the future. Now, I know I've used the names of some of the big companies or well-known companies out there, but the real stories of success are happening in big and small companies, in big teams and small teams. And so don't let uh, the names of these companies maybe intimidate you or make you think that, oh, we couldn't possibly implement that because that's definitely not the truth. So the future of work is here. The way that we work has changed forever. How are you going to work differently going forward? Thanks for listening to another episode of the Tomorrow Today podcast. If you're a leader, manager, or just someone interested in how the workplace is evolving, I hope that these insights uh, sparked some new ideas for your team and your business. Please go ahead and uh, check the show notes for, uh, for any ideas that you want to recap on on what was covered today but follow us on social media as well with the links that are provided and remember to subscribe to the podcast wherever you're listening to it right now so go ahead hit that subscribe button go ahead and do it right now see you in the next episode of the tomorrow today podcast mapping the future of business mm -hmm.